I invoke our mothers, our grandmothers, and our femme ancestries. I invoke the teachers, healers, mentors, caregivers, and warrior women of history. I invoke Femmes of all genders, bloods, ages, lineages, generations of witches and fighters who infuse the universe with love, rage, and magic. I invoke the dynasties of femmes who gouged the earth with their bare hands and planted roots from the seeds of their hunger the bloodlines of women and femmes whose bodies are steep with the darkness of the Kala Pani, whose spirits are awash with the cleansing light of the full moon. I my great grandmothers, whose unknowing bodies stormed on a ship from the continent to the island, hands tied, bodies battered, minds resilient. I invoke the deities who never made it to the shores, their copper flesh, an offering to the creatures that live along the edge of the unknown, where ocean becomes sky and sky becomes ocean. I invoke the generations who suffered, who died, who lived, who fought, who resisted patriarchy and colonialism on sugarcane plantations. I honor my mother, Vimala Devi, nurse, caregiver, teacher, mentor, inspiration and embodiment of femme power. I honor her mother, Dana Pakion, whose fortitude knew no bounds, whose story remains untold, repressed, forgotten, chained, chained, chained to the silence of history. I honor Rita, whose womb carried ships of born and unborn children, brave mother who offered her milk and blood to quench the unconsolable longing of the aching land. I honor Katai, woman of rose water, saffron, betel leaves and nuts, whose rugged feet walked earth, sand, basalt and burning coal. I honor Kamala, whose ceremonial fingers enchant the dead and bring their spirits back to life. Uma, whose visions speak in femme tongues long forgotten. Lalita, whose sword flows like rivers longing for a sea to call home. Asha, whose ancestral lungs carry curses that quiver like crackles of burning sandalwood. Devika, whose grief is cavernous like a sinuous passage in the night sky. And I invoke, I invoke, I invoke, Strength 
strength and wisdom from goddess Kalima, redeemer of the universe, goddess of time, change and destruction, goddess with charcoal eyes and a blood tongue who cuts patriarchy and wears it as a garland around her neck, goddess with matted hair and ivory fangs who dismembers misogyny and wraps it as a skirt around her waist. That lineage, past, present and future, the women and femmes who reshape the universe, I invoke and I honor. So good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for having me. Uh, this was the, the invocation, which is actually the opening of Zoom, of Zoom Fam. And uh, I think it's important for me to, yeah, to start by invoking the lineages uh, that allow me to exist and be here. I come to you today uh, from Dijage on the traditional territories of the Genegihaga, um, which in colonial terms is known as Montreal, Quebec. Um, it's it's meaningful and and kind of like nerve wracking a little bit to come back to Trent, even if I'm not physically in Peterborough. Uh, Ten years after having graduated from the, what used to be called the TCP program, the Theory, Culture, and Politics program, um, so it's it yeah it kind of feels like a, a bit of a full circle moment. And and there's a part of me that was just thinking of me when you know the speaker series that we used to have at the time on Thursday evenings and and that first time that we <laughs> we actually met went to to meet uh, to meet the the very first speaker I believe the first speaker who had come when I came to to Trent in my first year of MA was just be a poor um, and terrorist assemblages had just been published uh, at the time um, so yeah meaningful to be able to come back uh, I will confess that I do not have the uh, best memories of Trent <laughs> or <laughs> Peterborough <laughs> um, being, but um, yeah, it's, it's kind of weird because I think I was disillusioned with, with academia, North American academia, because I had come from doing my undergrad in India into grad school in Canada. Um, and, I think, and I think there was a lot of things that I did not understand even around, I didn't know I was a person of color when I landed in Peterborough in 2008. <laughs> so just to tell you about like, yeah, where that experience began. And, um, and I think I had a bit of a rough time, but also uh, I want to give a shout out uh, to Charmaine Eddy, who was my thesis supervisor. And uh, really, <laughs> I don't think I would have finished this degree without her support, uh, her very concrete support. Um, and I see that Veronica Hollinger is also here right now. So I wanna say hi. Uh, um, Veronica was a reader on my thesis, on my uh, project. And uh, I wanna give a shout out to Yanni Kong and uh, Beth Lyons, who were the two only women who were part of our program <laughs> at the time. Um, so anyway, so that's in terms of my intro. So now that I've gotten the nervousness out of my system, uh, I'm going to get started with uh, my presentation for today. And I'm going to start by sharing my screen because um, I prepared a little presentation for you. Uh, Trying to, there we go. Let's share sound. Let's make sure we got this. Is this working? Uh, can you see the screen? Yeah, I got a thumbs up. Okay, perfect. So, um, so yes, so I'm going to be talking about interstices and hybrid spaces and what that means to me uh, in terms of um, exercising a decolonial trans poetics that connects the past and the future. Um, um, this is kind of like it's at once a talk and a bit of like a, a studio visit. So I'm going to start by framing, giving you a bit of a broader idea of like the theoretical framework within which I ground my artistic practice. And from there, I'm going to go through some of the projects that I've developed to give you a more concrete idea of how 
uh, how they are in relationship and how uh, that decolonial poetics that I talk about, that trans decolonial poetics embodies itself in the, in the work um, that I do. So, okay. So I would very much at the core of my work, I am concerned with the question of how to articulate a decolonial text through intertextual and what I call intertextual artistic practices. Um, my life's work, I would say, emerges from a concern for justice and an imperative to heal from colonial past. Uh, in my work, I reimagine and I reformulate languages of the self in order to offer um, a counter memory for the future. So it's a rewriting, it's like looking into the past and rewriting an archive for the future, for the future generations. So in terms of looking at the past, I explore ancestral loss. Ancestral loss as a loss of bodies, of histories, of cultures, of languages, of genders, of knowledge systems, and very much of spiritual practices. And I look at how can we access uh, this ancestral past, all those parts of ourselves that have been fragmented and lost in, in the colonial intervention, in order to then rewrite the marginalized and the silenced voice within the contemporary context of uh, global imperialism that we live in. Um, so just to give a little bit context about my own personal history, I come from Mauritius, which, in, uh, which is an island of the African coast, uh, east of Madagascar. Um, and I'm from an Indo-African family, so I'm like, I come from a history of both slavery on my father's side and indentured labor on my mother's side, which was which indentured labor being the system that replaced slavery when sla replaced slavery, uh, you know, which was supposed to be a bet, the more politically correct system that replaced slavery after slavery was abolished. Um, so my family, my mom's family comes from South Asia originally uh, and came to the island as indentured labor. So I try to draw from the past and to in, in order of the present and then offer possibilities for the future. And I see that as a reacquisition of power to create one's own image. Um, I've already done for this. Uh, this is a quote that I take actually from Nubezi Philip, uh, who is uh, one of the, uh, oh, Sorry, just checking. Is my audio okay? Um, oh. it's, it's a little bit choppy. I think it might be the earplugs. Um, okay, so, so sorry. let me try. Let me try without the earphones. And I think I think the earrings are just touching the the. Oh, the maybe okay. Let's try. Let's try without the femme fashion. Sorry about that. Sorry to interrupt. No worries. No, thank you for having me. Uh, how is how is this? It sounds better to me. Yeah. Yeah. I'll keep talking. Thank you for yeah. Uh, thank you for interrupting. Feel free to let me know if oh it must yeah maybe it was the earrings just dangling against the <laughs> microphone. That's just here. Um, is that good? Okay. Thank you. So I'll keep going. Um, yeah, so the reacquisition of power to create one's own image as the I image uh, is something that uh, I um, that I have found in Nobezi Philip's work. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Nobezi Philip is actually one of the most influential poets uh, who has influenced my work. She is actually trained uh, as a lawyer. Uh, but is also a poet and does this very, you know, like really does this very interesting work in looking at how the law is grounded in language and so is poetry. Uh, uh, but she she tries her tongue was a very uh, influential book uh, and Zong as well. Um, for me, that really, me that tool of rethinking um, rethinking uh, how how do I create that language of the self and how do I make space in the world for that language of the self. So the I in my work then is multiple. It is an I that is descended of slaves and indentured labor. It is an I that grew up on the plantation island of Mauritius. 
it is an I that is economically working class, but culturally middle class. It is an I that is filled with queer desires. It is an I that crosses normative gender lines. It is an I that also grew up in a family that was Catholic and Hindu. And it is an I that is at once East African, South Asian, and in the process of becoming Canadian slash Quebec specifically. Uh, and it is an I that is trilingual, that exists between English, French, and Creole. So two colonial languages and one ancestral language. And for me, this I, this multiplicity and hybridity of the I that are of the core of who I am cannot be re restrained by singularity. I don't think it can be. So my voice then is multiple. It moves across and beyond definitions. And for me, it is a voice that is imbued in what Avery Gordon calls complex personhood. Um, Avery Go Ghostly Matters was one of the books that I discovered when I was actually uh, studying a trend and it has stayed with me. I still read it and reread it even after all those years. Um, and I think I've, I've come to understand a lot of my own artistic work as that calling of haunting basically, which is why I always go back to the past. Uh, but Avery Gordon talks about complex personhood. Complex personhood means that people suffer in different ways. They recognize and misrecognize themselves and others. They often remain wedged in the symptoms of their troubles, and they also often change and transform themselves. Besides, complex personhood also means that people tell themselves stories about themselves, about their troubles, their lives, their worlds, the societies they are living in, and they negotiate those worlds through stories that negotiate the reality that is immediately available to them and what the yearnings that their imagination is striving towards. So there's some things uh, very central for me here about the, the nature of storytelling in particular and how complex storytelling is in term and how it, it's not something that it's fixed and it is something that changes uh, based on time, context, uh, situations, uh, etc. Um, so then this I, for me, um, is, yeah, okay, I'll come, sorry. This I, for me, is then cannot be, the I in my work cannot be constrained by disciplinarity either. Um, so I, now that I'm saying this out loud, I realize probably that's why I ended up in the theory, culture, and politics program, because even at the time, interdisciplinarity was at, like, at the core of what I wanted to do. Uh, at the time. So, but now in my artistic practice, I work across live performance, poetry, installations, textiles, and visual arts to be able to speak multiple aesthetic and political voices that enunciate a decolonial poetics. So the voice then in the body of my work expresses itself across different media, but also very much at the interstice between each of those media. And I find those intermedia spaces extremely rich. I think they are a territory that then allows me um, to elaborate what Homi Baba calls strategies of selfhood, singular and communal, that initiate kinds of identity and innovative sites of collaboration and con contestation. The interstitial passage between fixed identifications opens up the possibility for or of a cultural hybridity that enter entertains difference without an assume or impose hierarchy. So for me, through interdisciplinary practice, then I create in-between spaces and in-between voices, which then offer a, a kaleidoscopic view of my own subjectivities as they relate to space, to time, to kinship, uh, and to history. And in my work, then I refigure my own corporality as being multiple, as transgressing genres, locations, bodies, tongues, spaces, uh, and temporalities. And there's, there's something for me about the hybrid space also as being the, the space where the ghost can actually come into life. The ghost can actually manifest herself, right? The being neither living nor dead. So if we go back to that notion of, of haunting um, and an and, and ancestral past, for me, it's in the interspace actually that the, the decolonial um, enunciation and vocabulary can emerge. Um, so typically then in my work, just like in, in the more concrete sense of it, 
um, I, I do a lot of multi-year, uh, a lot of my work is, is grounded, is really developed over time, uh, over years in intermediate practice. And I ground it in archival research, in community engaged research, and also family histories or community histories when I'm working uh, on those themes. Uh, so they emerge from personal histories, family histories, autoethnography, grassroots collective knowledge. Um, and of course, there's the influence of critical theory because clearly I was very well trained. Uh, and there's always the, the, the theoretical framework for me that, that, that comes to support the work and the reflection around the work. Um, and I'm very much process oriented in my work. Like I don't ever start knowing I'm going to make an installation. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write a poem. I'm going to create a performance. Um, I typically just let, let myself be inhabited by the material, whatever is the voice of the ghost that might be emerging in the moment. And I let that the idea inhabit me and it becomes a bit of, of an obsession uh, actually uh, over time. And then as, as the, the research then takes place, I, I tend to let the material, I tend to ask the material, like, what do you want to become? And sometimes I hear, I want to become a poem. And I'm like, okay, we're going to write a poem. Sometimes I hear, I want to become a poem and an installation at the same time. And I'm like, okay, let's see, let's see where that goes. And a lot of times I start with an art form and then art form leaks into another one and another one. I'll be giving you more concrete examples of that and how that plays out. Um, are we good so far? Is everybody following me? Is this, uh, yeah, okay, uh, great. Uh, so we're gonna keep going. I'm gonna have a little sip of tea before we keep going. So now I'm going to go into, um, I'm going to break down some previous uh, projects that I've worked on, and I'm going to be talking about them and the, multi the multiplicity uh, of angles through which like, I end up coming to those projects. Um, so I'm going to start with this one from Fake Skin to Femme Armor, which was actually one of my earliest uh, projects, one of my very first ones. Uh, it's a project, it was a textile project. Um, and that was around the time when I had just moved to Montreal and, you know, I, there's a way in which I was exploring gender and playing with gender and, um, uh, you know, also like in more physical ways, um, like in more, you know, like in less spiritual ways, but in more like how I was presenting to the world and to society. Um, and I was really, I was really um, intrigued by that question. Like, how is it that us as people of color, as racialized people who are specifically on top of that visibly trans or, or gender queer or, you know, who don't fit in the norm, like the kinds of thick skins we need to have. Um, and, and for me, there was always there, there was that relationship between gender and race in the sense of I'm like, yeah, we, we need to put on thick, a thick skin. But also for me, it's like it felt like every day I had to put on an armor. It was a femme armor. It was a feminine armor. Um, and which for me is like it's part of my relationship to femininity because I think about it as a as an armor, you know, in terms of like the makeup and the accessories. And, and it's like you, you need to for me, it's like putting up this 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 thing that gives you the strength, and then you step out into the world. But then it's that armor of strength, which is also which which is what triggers violence against trans people, right? Like it is that same armor that then um, so comes back as as triggers violence in others. So I really wanted to explore that tension specifically between that 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 strength, but also that vulnerability tied to it. So what I did with from thick skin to femme armor, um, this is I, I start by showing you what, what the final piece became, uh, and I will talk about this. So what I did with this piece is I actually interviewed. Uh, seven femmes of color, racialized femmes who are part of my network, part of my community, friends of mine, people whom I love. And I did like in-depth interviews where we talked about everything from spirituality, violence, fashion, uh, what does it mean, like, you know, the intersections between race and gender and what does it mean to be trans according to everybody's own personal histories and, and, and origin. And then did with it, I actually, um, I treated each of those interviews and from those interviews, I selected 49 quotes from the interviews. And then I did a, a residency 
uh, in Halifax uh, in a screen printing studio, which is kind of like the background work that I'm showing you. Um, and with that, I basically um, sewed the 50, the, there were 50 pieces in the piece, but like 49 quotes. And I sewed it all back together uh, into this piece. And I, I like to think about it, it's like a zine, but instead of opening a zine and reading it from page to page, it's actually a 3D zine and you need to walk around it to be able to interact with it. Um, so that's a bit of, of the process and uh, that went behind it uh, in terms of, of uh, making this piece. And I'm gonna read some of the quotes for you as well. Uh, so this one says, the FM's your most powerful magic has always been you. The other one says, my femme philosophy does not live in words. It lives in my body, in gestures, in feelings that move through me. Being femme is about embodying playfulness. Femme is about finding power in play. Um, and there are some more here. Um, maybe I'm gonna read the next one. Uh, this one says, Crop tops go with literally everything, everything. Hashtag bellies everywhere 2015. That was the question about fashion. Uh, so I did this interview in 2015. Uh, the other one says, my femme is a divine gift that came to me in a dream and demanded to live as a teen when I was scared, in pain, depressed, suicidal. My femme demanded, oh, I have the, I can't read the rest of it on my screen because, oh, demanded that I live so I could give birth, I could birth it in this way being femme saved my life. Um, and this one is my favorite, actually, which is the one I saw by the chest, by the heart. It says being femme is self-love. So the thing about this piece then is that it's, you know, it, it, it's a community project that brings about textual text and textile together uh, on the one hand. And, um, but then it's, it's, it's a 3D piece that exists on its own like that, but also it's a wearable piece, right? Like it's actually a garment that I can wear and I have actually worn this garment and performed, did a perform, done a performance around this text, right? And that same uh, performance was then photographed and later on exhibited, right? And for me, there's that question that then is raised, where does the work of art start and where does it end, right? Like, is the work of art in the text? Is it in the textile? Is it in the installation? Is it in the garment when I'm wearing it? Is it in me when I'm performing in the garment? Or is it in the documentation of the performance that then becomes its own photography that's in Right, like so, so. There's something for me about going against discipline and blurring those lines and creating different points of access and different points of entry to the work and 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 to the statement of the work and to the voc vocabulary that emerges from it. Um, so that's one example where I work with textile uh, and text. Oh, great! I still have some time. Um, so that's from thick skin to femme armor. Um, the next project that I'm going to be talking to you about is Bois d'Eben. Bois d'Eben means ebony wood in English, and uh, it's a term. So this project, maybe it's, well, let me explain first. Uh, Bois d'Eben is, um, yeah, so it means ebony wood. And it's interesting because uh, I found out while I was doing art archival research uh, living in Quebec, that Bois d'Eben was actually the term of how slaves, black slaves would be called. I say black slaves because there were also indigenous slaves in Quebec. So Bois d'Eben was the term that was actually, you know, like, and, and I found that so interesting. But on the other hand of it, I, one of the things that I found out while doing this research is that the fleur de lis, which is the, the symbol, like, you know, the most nationalist prominent symbol of Quebec where I live, um, that the fleur de lis used to be actually what the what we used to be branded on slaves and that was like one of those moments for me of like really where, where I, you know of like realizing that this symbol that is actually everywhere right it, it is the nationalist symbol is also imbricated in this long violent history right like which we don't know about um, so we what even what I did so a lot of my work then is it's what even is a performance installation that then becomes its own installations so what you see here is the installation after the performance that's what you're seeing on the screen and um, that part is important for me um, a, a lot of times when I'm working in performance there's always an installation there's something that stays back because uh, I and that part is important for me because I 
um, you know, whenever we, we, we're thinking of questions of violence or trauma, right, like the reason why we talk about intergenerational trauma is that we, even if we're talking of the most minute microaggression, right, like it's, is that it happens in a particular moment, but the repercussions continue living in the body. So whenever for me, when I work on those pieces, especially when they dealing with like a, a more violent history, it's important for me that there's something that stays so that it's not just in the moment of the performance where the, the body of the performer is there, where we, you know, the engagement is there, but then once the body is no longer there, because, you know, that's the nature of performance, that there's always a trace that continues the story behind. So that's the installation after the performance. So with this performance, so now I'm going to show you some pictures from the performance. It was at Fondry Darling, which is like uh, in downtown slash the old port of, of Montreal. And it, it's actually a performance that happened outside. And it happened within like an entire installation that you can see on the ground right now. And it was interesting because the installation were also textiles. And, I, and you see them here, the white pieces, the textiles. Uh, you see the shape less here, but like in the performance, those were actually cut out in the shape of the Quebec map. And I found that so interesting because everybody recognizes the fleur de lis, but nobody could recognize that, oh, this is actually the map of Quebec. Um, so, and this performance was very much about grieving. It was very much around how do we give voice to the dead? How do we find the bones of the people who were never honored, whose existence was never recognized, and how do we grieve for them? How do we create a space for grieving that honors that they were actually there and that their bones live in, in the soil in which we live, um, uh, on which we live? Um, so that was a uh, Ben performance, and I'm gonna show you uh, an excerpt uh, from this performance. I'm gonna reduce the... So that's uh, an excerpt from Waliban. This is one of the pieces, normally, I mean, as you know, I'm a poet and I tend to work with languages a lot, like in between English, French and Creole. Um, and then there are those moments where, which is why I think I also have the, in this an interdisciplinary practice. And I think a lot of the nature of grief specifically, and this was one of the performance where, where I was like, I cannot use language, like there is no words, right? Like, and so this was one, one of the performance, um, performances where, a few performances where there's no poetry at all, um, actually. So uh, let me do time check. Okay, let's keep going. Um, so now we're gonna switch gears a little bit in terms of the nature of the work. And the next project that I'm gonna present to you is uh, Breaking the Promise of Tropical Emptiness, Trans Subjectivity in the Postcard. So the first two projects from Fixed Skin to Femme Homme and Body Band that I presented were very much projects that are more grounded within the Quebecois and Canadian contexts. Uh, but a lot of my work increasingly so I would say over the past, three maybe five years has been I've been working going back in many ways it's kind of like a, a, a homecoming and I've been like going back to working um, with Mauritius and with uh, islands and colonial histories and understandings of displacement and sovereignty for islands um, which is so which is very much what my newer work uh, is about as well uh, and a lot of it started with this project um, breaking the promise of tropical emptiness and this project came about when I had gone back to Mauritius um, a few years ago and I had this moment that like really struck me uh, when I was looking at the postcard postcards of Mauritius and how those little cliches, postcards, be you know, that are supposed to be representing the space of the island, 
always devoid. There, were ne there was never any form of local subjectivity in any of those representations. There was never a black body in there. There was never a brown body in there. And it always sold that idea of landscapes, empty landscapes that tourists can come and colonize for two weeks in a resort, right? Like, which is very much um, what postcards show us and what tourist uh, uh, paraphernalia is about. And I really wanted to speak back against that. And, 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 and you know, and, 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 and the postcard as a colonial, as a colonial artifact as well, and, and speak back to that, that tradition and that history. And um, so what I did with those is actually over two, two, two years, I mean, not over two years, I, one month, two, two years apart, I went back and I found the, the places, the cliches of the spaces that typically are in postcards. And I re, and I, uh, re-photograph them by foregrounding like my body uh, I, within in the middle of the um, of the of the frame and that was important for me as well because just also in terms of not just only bringing a black brown body in the center of the frame but also bringing a trans body right like is it within even within the Mauritian context uh, trans people live still on the margins and I really wanted to bring that uh, central uh, uh, subjectivity into the middle of the space. And then this project from there evolved, and I'm in a moment I'm gonna be talking about Queering the Island Body, which is the project that I'm exhibiting at present at um, a la Galerie du Camp for Momenta, the Biennale here in Montreal. As I was working on this project, uh, I also then started exploring further um, actually the, the spiritual relationship, you know, I, between the trans and the what I call the body of the island, right? Like is thinking of histories, thinking of trans histories uh, outside of the Western context is that historically uh, trans people in many communities across the globe, including in Mauritius, uh, including in South Asia, which was actually what my thesis was about when I was at TCP, uh, when I did my MA at Trent and, um, you know, and including in, you know, what now we call two-spirit people within indigenous context here on Turtle Island was that trans people actually had, um, you know, a, a sacred, uh, 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 they were spiritual leaders of their communities, right? Like, because, because again, it would come back to that idea of middle space in the sense of you, were, you being neither man nor woman meant that you could also travel. Traveling across genders also meant that you could travel between the worlds of the spirits and the world of the living. And this is something that, this is something that got lost through the the intervention like I, I love reminding people of that that, like, that the, the binary itself the binary of men and women male and female as being the only two genders was actually a tool of colonization that was also one of, of, of the co colonial tools of the European global expansion which leads us to the context where we live today which makes it so that in a place like Canada but also in a place like Mauritius that inherited that was a British colony right like the the institutions that we inter um, inherited, whether they were legal, whether they were medical, those were actually all colonial institutions, right? And the, the gender binary is embedded in that. So part of the quest in terms of thinking about ancestry, then for me is reclaiming that way of being trans, like going back to a notion of spirituality where being trans then is also puts me in connection to the lands and to the waters. So from, from this project came wearing the island body then, which, uh, you know, like, and that's where even like my performance practice and everything really started moving more towards ritual um, and, and towards exploring the spiritual space. So really, what is the spiritual space that exists between the queer body and what I call the island body? And within that framework as well, so that's kind of like how we get into querying the island body. Technically speaking, so this is what is being exhibited right now uh, as part of um, at La Galerie du Cam, or what I'm exhibiting. Uh, this wasn't supposed to be the photography series. I was supposed to work on a totally new photography series, but then, you know, the pandemic hit, couldn't travel, all of this. But in the end, like I'm still showing this series as part of the exhibit. And then the other part of the exhibit um, is actually uh, a textile, so there's a textile installation and there's um, a video installation and there's also a performance that I did a couple of weeks ago. 
Um, so with this, really, um, I was really moving into the question of like, so the relation, again, thinking about the island body and the ways in which within a colonial frame, I mean, already within like colonial frameworks, generally speaking, we tend to talk about Masi, you know, the continent. We like, like, I feel like islands tend to a lot of times, even when we're talking about colonial history, fall through the cracks and we don't think about the space of the ocean and, and islands, generally speaking. Uh, and that's something that I wanted to speak uh, uh, against, uh, actually, and really thinking for the question of boundaries, like what is, you know, like when in the colonial frameworks of how territories have been divided, there's a clear line between, I don't know, the US and Canada, right? There's a line that has been drawn, but we don't have that for islands, right? Because actually islands continue into the ocean. The Mauritian territory is an archipelago. It's not one island, um, but there's no way of actually drawing that line and then it becomes complicated in terms of like ocean politics and who's accountable to the different kinds of ecological exploitation that happens in the oceans so anyway so with this project um so i so i'll talk about the salt first so the video that is being projected on the ground is actually being projected on a um, a, a bed of salt and salt is a material that i've worked with many many times over many years uh, because it's a, um, for me, I started working with salt basically, first of all, as in, in the beginning, as a way of working with the notion of the ocean, right? Like the fact that the ocean is filled with salt and it's the ocean that witness, uh, you know, the loss of the languages, right? The, the loss of the ancestors and that journey. And given that I, I started working with salt in this way, but also salt then is the material that can dissolve and then can also crystallize again and it became more and more meaningful in my work and I think about salt also as the salt of the ancestors right who came to work in the plantation islands and you know and whose salt live in 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 um, in the soil in the land the island um so so the, the 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 video is about salt I will show you an excerpt in a moment and it's projected on a bed of salt but now to go back to the textiles the textiles are also imbricated with salt and what I did, so the textiles are either there's, there's the, the islands, the archipelagos in red, blue, yellow, and green. Um, red, blue, yellow, and green, because those are the colors of the national flag of Mauritius. But what's interesting about the national flag of Mauritius is that those, the, those colors were chosen based on the colors of the landscape. Uh, the red of the flamboyant tree, the blue of the ocean, the green of the forest and the sugarcane fields, and the, and the yellow um, of the sunset and the beaches. Uh, and I found that interesting that even within the notion of the, of, of the, the natural space, there's something that was directly related to the landscape there. And I wanted to reformulate and, and re, re, reimagine that notion of archipelago and where does the body of the island begin and where does it end? So the, the textures that you see in red, blue, blue, yellow, and green, actually the entire textile is imbricated with salt and the specific textures are actually made with salt as well. And there's also poetry then on it, which is, that's where the text and the textile meet again. The poetry is in English, French, and Creole, it's trilingual. So I think about it as archipelagos of poetry also bringing that agency uh, as a trans person in relationship with the island that then redefines the boundary, the colonial boundary that was given to the island. Am I making sense? I feel like I'm saying a lot of things right now. <laughs> we'll have time for questions. Let me do a time check. Okay, we have just time to go over everything. Now I'm gonna show you just, uh, just to give a bit of a sense I know it's not the real thing I don't have professional documentation for this because the exhibit just opened but I shot a little video to show you what it looks like um, in the the projection on salt Yeah, and uh, this video that is being projected is called Your Body is the Ocean. And the video itself came from one of the poems in Zomfam, which is called Your Body in the, is the Ocean. Maybe during the Q&A, we can talk more about intertextuality and all of this. Maybe the last little thing that I'm gonna share with you about this project is, so as part 
of this project as well, uh, I was invited to create um, uh, an, um, an augmented reality and AR project around queering the island body. So it's a filter that you can access through Instagram or through Facebook that allows you to create your own island body wherever you are in whichever context. So I'm just gonna show you an example of like what that filter looks like. So that's just to give you a sense of it. Maybe at the end of the talk, if you're on Instagram, I can explain to you how to access. Just look up Kamala Macwell on your filters on Instagram and Facebook and you'll find it. And please try it and tag me because I would love to see it on lakes and rivers and different in your garden. I would love to see this in different contexts and how the island body can take shape in, in, within different contexts. Um, so now I'm going to go straight. I'm going to skip all of this. Uh, maybe I'll show you this are also earlier works that I've done with textiles. And this work is actually, um, th this are actually made on saris that my mother gave me um, as a garment I get to, I guess, to express her acceptance of my gender. Um, but yeah, I'm not gonna go into the details of it. It's about the personal and the political and how they weave. But like for the interest of time, I'm gonna go straight into Zumfam and then we can open it out for, for questions and discussions. Um, so yeah, I, I started with Zomfam. So Zomfam is my debut poetry collection that came out exactly a year ago uh, in September 2020. And so the story with this piece, and, and there's a lot of interdisciplinarity within this, um, is initially actually I, I had, you know, I was doing a lot of spoken word. And typically me doing spoken word was just me standing in front of a microphone and like doing my piece and that was it. And my voice was what would travel in the space. Um, with time, I had realized actually that I had all those multiple pieces that I had written uh, and it was almost like all those pieces were like speaking back to me and that's when I realized, oh, actually there's a body of work there and there's a story being told. What am I going to do with this story? I had never realized that I was writing a story because I had written those pieces separately. So then I turned it into a manuscript, which became Zomfam, which became the book. Uh, but before Zomfam became the book, Zomfam was first, the manuscript was first developed uh, actually as a performance, uh, as a performance. Um, and the question that I had asked myself was that, you know, I had been doing spoken word for a while. And again, you're on a stage and it's just you and a mic stand. And I was really obsessed with the question of how would poetry look like and feel like if poetry could move through the body and if poetry could move across space. Like I wanted to go just standing in front of a mic. Uh, that was really the question that I was asking myself. Um, and that's how I developed the manuscript of Zomfam, which is what became the show. Uh, the show was supposed to premiere in April 2020 and we all know what happened in March 2020. Didn't happen, it got pushed to October 2020, two days before the premiere, Mar uh, Montreal entered the red zone, got canceled again. So the, the show never met an audience, but I have faith that someday when the universe is ready and the show is ready, that meeting is gonna happen. Uh, yes, there's this, the scene, your body is the ocean in the, in the show involves 25 kgs of salt. Uh, that is part of the performance actually. Um, so I had developed the manuscript as a performance first. And it's only after I developed the manuscript as a performance that I signed a publishing contract with Metonymy Press that published this book. And then when I had to, turn the, um, this manuscript into a book, uh, I really started then asking myself, how do I bring the performative quality of the performance into the book? So as I developed it, I really started thinking as the text on the page, uh, as the body of the text that is performing on the page in the same way that the body of the performer performs on the stage. Um, so if you, you know, get a copy of the book, if you do, I hope you will, um, you know, like part of the, of, of what I brought into this book for me was really thinking of how does then, how does that performative quality transpire across the page? So everything is laid out in very intentional ways that actually breaks the rhythm or brings the rhythm or creates a dramaturgy on the page. 
uh, and all of this is very intentional in terms of how, how um, uh, yes, how the performance comes into the page, uh, which for me again allows create the sorts of interspaces, right, that blurs the lines between those multiple forms. And I think that's where, I like to think that that's where magic happens. Uh, I'm gonna show you before I wrap up, um, just a quick excerpt, uh, it's a quick trailer from, from the performance so you get an idea of what it looks like. And then I think we can, I'm gonna wrap it up here. There is a voice that does not speak English, does not speak French, and yet echoes wisdom and truth in my bloodstream like the waves of the ocean that witness the loss of our languages. And that voice tells me that I do not need an imperial language to define myself, that I do not need to be trans in English or in French, that colonialism has already wrapped itself like a knot around our vocal cords. And even though our lineage is one of silence that we weave in between our intimacies, this voice exists deep within, and it speaks like my mother, like my grandmother, like my great-grandmother like the generations of women and femmes who fought to keep our language alive and pass it on from generation to generation. Yeah, uh, and then maybe since I'm already here, those are just some images, documentation from, from the performance uh, that you, for which you just saw the trailer. And uh, yeah, which brings us to the end, <laughs> slash to the more interesting part, which is the uh, Q&A part. Thank you very much for having me, everyone. Thank you for being present. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's been working in the background uh, to make uh, this, this happen this evening. I'm gonna stop sharing. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kama. Um, so I, I if you don't mind, I would like to start with a question. Um, since I'm the host, and maybe I can take that privilege. Um, it was really nice to hear all of the things that you've been doing since I last saw you. I think when we last met, you were doing the uh, From Thick Skin to Femme Armor project, which is a long time ago now. Um, I'm going to ask the most boring question um, <laughs> because it's like, you know, I'm thinking about knowledge and I'm thinking about pedagogy and I'm also just thinking about the sort of um, the trajectory that you've outlined for us. And the fact that you ended in Marusha's and you're talking about the island body, but you began your story tonight in Peterborough <laughs> exactly 10 years ago. And I'm curious about sort of maybe I guess, turning back to some of the words that you were using to describe uh, the work that you're doing back then. Because it strikes me that um, a lot of the work you were doing, I would describe as, as broadly autobiographical in the sense that, I mean, the work of autobiography is a, is a method of disclosure um, that doesn't necessarily um, accommodate itself to evidence-based work. In other words, that you access a truth through a disclosure that's um, that's irrefutable, and so you made a, a bunch of uh, comments about you know uh, Avery Gordon complex personhood and Homi Baba and strategies of selfhood, and I'm just thinking about the ways that you that you framed the work that you were doing in Peterborough as archival research, community engaged research, autoethnography, critical theory. And I mean, those are like, that's like such a different, uh, for me, it's some, such a different context from the very rich work that you've done since then, which is performance, textile, photography, uh, poetry, and many other things besides. So I'm just curious about like, um, how do you understand that moment? And, you know, to what extent was it generative? Was it uh, was the language that you were using back then, uh, would you describe it as an alibi or was it a motivator? I'm just curious about how retrospectively now you think about that, that stuff you did in Peterborough. 
Ooh. <laughs> you want to get into the juicy stuff. <laughs> uh, good question. Thank you for that question. I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, like for me, there's always is you know however complicated I feel now about like my time in Peterborough and at Trent I you know I I'm grateful for the theoretical training that I got like there's there's something for me about um however much I was struggling with it you know but um there's something about the rigor of working with theory and through theory um, to articulate whatever it is that we're trying to articulate, right? Like, and in my case, like, yeah, I was working on, on the, my, my thesis roughly was around the histories of masculinity in South Asia broadly um, and how the colonial intervention changed that. And, um, and I think there's value in that. I think there's definitely value in that, in what it taught me. Uh, I think definitely writing a thesis taught me so much about writing <laughs> and a particular kind of rigor around writing. Um, and that's something that I think I still carry very much now. Um, and reading, I have to say, and also reading, right? Like the fact that like every once in a while, I might just like pull out my specters of marks. I'm like, let's, let's go back to what Derrida had said, right? Like, I don't think I wouldn't have been able to do this without the training that taught me how to do that. But I think what changed, you know, I think it was whatever it was in terms of my experience. Uh, I think I, I naively landed in a trend thinking at the time that I would go for an academic career. Like that's really what I was thinking. Um, and that didn't happen, which now looking back, I'm like, that's very much, that was such a blessing that it didn't happen. Um, and I think what, I think, theory gives you access to something, to a particular thing. And I think I wanted access to more, right? Like I wanted access, uh, I wanted access, yes, I wanted access to more, like to, to all the forms, right? Like you see, you see the, the pl plurality of my artistic practice now, right? Like, and I, I think I wanted to create something like, you know, I, th that felt cosmopolitan somehow, right? That, that, that felt, that I could draw, you know, like that, even with, you know, because I, when I left uh, Trent and I moved to Montreal, um, my first couple of years, I was like waiting tables, working in kitchens and stuff like that. And then I spent three years working full time in the community sector for a social justice organization, right? Like where there the pedagogy was very much about popular culture, right? What is, as marginalized people, when you're working with other marginalized people, what are the forms of everyday knowledge that you're already creating, right? Like, and I think about it even when I think about my ancestors and histories, right? Like my family navigated patriarchy and colonialism on the sugarcane plantations. The women of my family did that. They never called it feminism. They never read any Judith Butler, but they had the knowledge to navigate it on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. And for me, then it became about what are the different forms of knowledge and knowledge making and knowledge generation, generating of knowledge and sharing that we can value. And I feel that outside, as much as I value the theoretical framework, um, outside of academia, because that's the thing, I'm talking about the theoretical framework, and then there's also very much the dynamics of being in academia, right? Like, there's also that part, right? With all its power dynamics, with all its internal, external politics, like, you know, there's like an entire thing happening there, right? And I think for me, I wanted that independence of being able to work outside of this, because then I would be able to work in my own terms, and then create, like, carve the path based on, like, the multiple forms of learning that I could get in different contexts and then carve uh, a way for me to then um, still do research because I, I still think of my art practice as being very research-based and in many ways still be generating knowledge but then doing it in a different form and I think the last thing that I would say is also um, you know there is a difference to like okay I'll just say it you know like you write a thesis and like five people read it if you're lucky uh, and there's something about being on a stage and you're like speaking to 200 people and they're there and you can look every single one of them in the eye and you're like I'm telling you a story right now and you're bearing witness there's also that part in terms of thinking of the impact 
uh, of the work. I'm like, you know, and, and I don't, I say this like very kindly, I don't say this with any, like, I think there's deep value to doing intellectual work and, you know, in the ways that all of you are doing as academics, but it's just not the path that I chose because I think I wanted to do something different. But yeah, that was more playful as well. Yeah, thanks. I, I don't want to take up more space. I just I find it so fascinating to think about, um, you know, uh, theoretical knowledge and the anxieties that people experience with having to sort of construct a knowledge using that vocabulary and that discourse um, and the ways in which that uh, knowledge holds a lot of power, like a power, uh, an empowerment, but also a, uh you know a negative power as well so just curious about that but maybe could i open it up to the room and see if there are questions for come up i see case yes there we go had to unmute myself i just want to start by saying that was so that was such a an incredibly fascinating and um compelling performance like because it was you know it was, it was a it was a talk about your your artistic work but it was also a, a performance i'm very excited about everything that you just did um so thank you uh but i was wondering if um because you talked a little bit about your um uh your you know your your creative process uh, more generally and you walked us through a little bit of you know your your thought process and your creative process for the the five uh, projects that you that you talked about, but I was wondering if you could um, just elaborate on the creative process behind, um, or or maybe not the creative process necessarily, but your how how you got to uh, the invocation the the opening piece you started with because it was that was that was so good I. Oh, <laughs> so I, I would love to hear more about that. Thank you. I love this question, actually. Thank you. Uh, I love this question. Um, you know, I, uh, I mean, as I had mentioned, and I worked in the community sector, and then now I'm very much like, you know, I, I run a lot of community arts program, mostly for queer trans youth, racialized indigenous queer trans youth. I've been like doing a lot of mentorship and stuff like that. And whenever I, I do that kind of work, whenever I, um, you know, sometimes even when I'm like running workshops, one of the questions that I like to start with is, what is it that makes your life possible, right? Like, what is it that allows you to exist in this present time, in this present space, right? And, and for me, when I think of that question and when I answer, you know, like the first thing that I always think about is we need to think about our relationship to the lands and the waters, right? Like those are the territories that feed us, that give us the food that we eat, that give us the oxygen that we breathe, that give us the water that we drink and we wouldn't exist without them, right? Like, and to start with that, you know, like I, I start with that always, which is why I think, you know, like more than like territorial acknowledgements that we, we, we tend to make, I think it's a deeper, if we frame it, it's a deeper question than just like making a territorial acknowledgement, right? Like, so I start with that question of what makes our lives possible and, and the question of gratitude and humility, right? Because we, I wouldn't exist. I wouldn't exist as a person that I am, as the artist that I am. I wouldn't be able to have the voice that I had, I have now if I didn't come from a lineage of queer, trans, black people who have resisted, who actually dreamt of a future for me so that now I get to live that future. And I think it's such an important question for every single one of us to actually ask ourselves that question, like what makes our life and our work possible, right? And, and, and that was really, uh, that's how the invocation came about. Because I was like, if I'm gonna start this piece, which at the time was a performance and now it's a book, on whose shoulders do I stand? Who paved the way for me? What are the lineages, the multiple lineages that I come from and how do I honor them? And it starts with that for me. It starts with the honoring. It starts with gratitude. It starts with that position of humility. And then, and from then, then I can do what, you know, what I'm doing. And then, you know, like, and, but yeah, that, that was the process for the invocation. I was like, 
who has my back? Who's paved the way for me? Whom do I need to honor? Whose voice haven't we heard so that now you get to hear mine, right? Like whose voice disappeared so that mine could emerge? And that was important. It was about bringing all those voices and honoring them and creating a space for them as the opening and saying, thank you, because I exist and my voice gets to exist because of you, of those multiple lineages. Thank you. That is, uh, sorry, I was, I, I, I was jotting it all down. That's, that's, that, thank you very much for answering that. Thank you for the question. I, I see Nina's hand. Yeah, thank you. I just, um, I think I'm just going to jump on that train right now. So first of all, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for, for tonight. I am, I just graduated from the Culture Studies MA last week and I'm kind of on my way to Montreal to wait tables. So this felt, uh, um, I felt really moved by your whole presentation. Um, and just now when you were explaining about your creative process, I'm, I'm also an international student and I'm wondering um, that when you're, you know, being in Montreal and in a different place, is it like, does it influence the connection you feel to the lineage, to the lineage and the land you come from? Does it make a difference that you're kind of not there, like on the land? Uh, yes, it does. Yes, I think it does. Um, I mean, it's, I think I always, I, I think I will always probably have complicated feelings about it, right? Because it's like, it's again, that sense of non-belonging, like, because Montreal is home, but then Mauritius is home, but I will never be able to belong to Mauritius in ways that I did, just like I will never somehow fully belong to Montreal, right? And I think that's just like the reality of just being an immigrant, of like being in, you know, in that in-between space. Um, but I think, you know, even when I was talking about the questions of, I, I think what it opened up for me, even when I was talking about that question of lineages, right? Like I can talk about my mother and my grandmother and my great grandmother and the lineage, lineage of women and resistance that I come from in terms of the plantation. But then once I'm here living within whatever colonial context that I'm living in here uh, in North America, right? Like there's a way in which like I understand and I, can, I, I start making space uh, for, you know, other racialized queer and trans lineages that maybe if I lived in Mauritius, I wouldn't have considered them as part of my lineage. But I think a lot of like trans resistance and the resistance of specifically black trans women in, in North America, right? Like, and, and that now the fact that I, I live here on those, in this land also makes it's such, you know, because when we think about lineage, for the first thing we think about is blood lineage. And that's something that I, I teach my youth a lot where, you know, like in my work where I'm like, yeah, but how do we think of, how do we think of lineages of resistance, right? Like it's not just blood lineages, like what about lineages of resistance that then allow, you know, what about, what about the trans women who fought so that we could exist now, right? Like, so, so for me, that part is important. So I think it's always, there's something to grieve. There's always something to grieve, but also there are other parts of you that then come into existence because you're in a different context. And then you, yeah, you start creating a world around, like, you know, your worldview becomes centered within the context where you are. And within that, you start honoring different histories and, and you know, and you build community and all of that. So it's it's both. It's always a tension, I would say. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, Sylvie? Um, hi. Uh, I really enjoyed the Kama, your uh, your reading or your performing from your your book Zom Fam. It really. I, I, then now I can get, get back to it and hear, hear your voice. And so I, I get what you say when you talk about performance. Well, I don't get it. I mean, I, I think I get what you say about performing. Um, my question was, was about, um, I don't know if it, it will make sense, about history and traces. Um, you know, you were talking about text and textile and those are things that leave traces. You also mentioned um, your performance that you, you know, how you like to leave 
something behind the performance for people to some kind of a landmark or something that will stay be, you know behind uh, after your performance and so i was wondering if you, you could um say a little bit more about how concerned you are about traces or about something that could could appear like a cleavage between oral and written history um so uh, or about the traces we leave Either in, either in writing or on people or in the world. So could you could you say something about this? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I I will talk about the past first, maybe right. Like I think there's a there's a you know like there's the obvious the material of archive right like which is the obvious materiality that we go to when we think about history when we think about the past. Um, you know, which has its legitimate space and is very helpful, of course, uh, although we can be critical of that, who gets to decide what goes into the archive, what is left out of the archive and all of this, right? Like, we could talk about this, but um, there's the archives, but I think one of the things that I'm interested in also in my practice is actually what doesn't make it into the archive, right? Like, what is... Um, for me, like with my family, I haven't, I haven't even known my grandparents. So I have very little sense of family history. And I never really thought about it until way into my 20s. Um, and a few years ago, I had, you know, I, I started doing like an oral history project with like members of my family, which was complicated, a lot of taboo, nobody wants to talk, like, you know, like, you just want to be in the silences. But still, I tried to build that relationship of like, you know, like in terms of like, oh, what is that trace on, on this, you know, in terms of the, the stories that we can get. But also one of the things that I'm interested in very specifically as an artist is also activating the traces that live in our DNA, right? Activating the haunting, activating the ghost in me. And, and that's where for me the spiritual practice becomes so important. And that's where I guess like, that's where I'm just like, I would fall out of academia entirely where, you know, what are the frameworks of knowledge that exist outside um, that, you know, um, outside empiricism that we can tap into, right? What are the modes of faith and the ways of existence and, and the ways of being and, and the ways of actually... So for me, it's been, you know, there's that notion of the trace in terms of activating, and a lot of it has been to, like, you know, like, I, I do a lot of meditation, but it's like a lot of it is, like, really connecting to that intuition right like connecting to that voice that comes from something that's just beyond you and then that becomes the trace and then like the art practice become about becomes about activating that trace so for me I believe in traces that are also beyond the physical or the empirical or the purely textual or the material I, I think there's I absolutely believe in this in my worldview um, so that's in terms of how I relate to traces in terms of a past and then I think um, you know, I think of traces then in terms of the art practice and what is left behind as again, you know, like I think it can be material, of course, it can be the installation that stays behind. But I think what I'm more interested in is um, what is, what has shifted in you, right? When you're bearing witness to a story, like I, as a storyteller, I believe that like when Aisha's story and you are bearing witness there's some way where we meet and that bearing witness that holding of my story transforms me and it also transforms you whomever the you is right like and in that moment of witnessing for me there's a trace that is left that's how I think about it as an artist. There's a trace that is, is left. You can think about it as a little seed that is, sometimes you're like, I'm, I'm moved. I walked out of this performance and I'm crying, right? Like, and you have like an immediate response. But I hope, it is my deepest hope that art also has this, trans and storytelling has this transformative power that I can also leave a trace that is like a little seed and maybe it won't, it won't show now, but maybe in 12 years, you know, that seed will break and something will emerge. And that's also part of the trace. Um, and increasingly, yeah, for me, my artistic practice is about that. It's about like, where do, where do our spirits meet and how do we transform each other through that process? Thank you so much. Um, we are running out of time, but we do have a number of hands. Uh, Egan? 
Uh, first off, thank you for the uh, really captivating talk as a performance. Um, I have a couple points, actually. Uh, the first one is a little bit quicker. It's on the mention of AR. So I do a lot of VR work and a lot of um, computer programming and game programming. So that's really interesting to me. Um, so I'm definitely going to check that out after the seminar is over. And I'll, I'll load up Instagram and check that out. And maybe I can make a post too. Um, I think that's really interesting to to look at um, that kind of virtual and digital lens. So that's what a lot of my work is going to be focused on. Um, and I'm kind of a little bit related almost in way of performance. Um, so your piece from Thick Skin to Femme Armor, I want to kind of comment on how it literally is gender as performance um, or like the performative gender. I can't remember who wrote that book. Um, but the idea of I know the book Butler. about it, but I remember who it's Judith by. Butler. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I, I talked about it earlier today, so I don't know why I couldn't remember the name. Um, but uh, the idea that um, like the femme armor being a performance act, right? Putting on makeup, certain clothing, um, etc., to to make yourself appear femme. Um, and pu putting on this armor is, is a way of performing, but also creating this piece um, that is a performance as an installation, or even wearing the piece and using that as a literal performance. I think it's really interesting to look at how um, you've taken that literal idea of gender as performance and em embodying that in a lot of your artwork. And that's really cool. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I. I've never thought about it this way. I can't remember my Judith Butler anymore. What was it? All gender is performance? Was it what it was about? <laughs> I can't remember. Um, so I, I see Lee and Swati. Lee? Thanks. Thank you, Kama, for being so generous with uh, all of your Well, I think Lee might have by the uh, the uh, me. Sorry, perhaps my internet is not so good. Okay. Um... Okay, I'll withdraw my question because my internet's not great. But I'll just make a comment in the chat. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lee. Uh, Swati. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for sharing your work. It's truly the layers to it. It's just very, very interesting and inspiring. I wanted to specifically speak to what you said about colonialism and decolonization. I want to understand how much of the process is disassociating and how much of it is accepting when you deal with navigate colonialism or the past that is very, very embedded in our histories. Can you tell me what you mean by disassociating? Like, just so I understand As in like rejecting, rejecting it, as in okay. just saying, no, mm -hmm. this doesn't happen, this didn't happen, and we will not recognize it. Or is the starting point a space where we accept it and then sort of like mm -hmm. move from it? Ooh, good question. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, good question. I mean, I think it's important to know. So when we, we, I'm talking about a decolonial poetics, right? Like, and I think it's important to know what we mean by decolonization because it means multiple things in different contexts, right? Like we talk about decolonizing the academia, decolonizing the archive, right? Like, I mean, if, you know, like I, I think that for me, the basic definition of decolonization is dismantling the settler state and you know and giving agency again to indigenous people for within this context right like so I think it means multiple things um I I think it's a make I would tend to say as somebody who is a lot into middle spaces I would say it's a mix of both I would say because we are already living within the colonial context with the colonial history uh within which we're living right like it's an it's not like we can fully step out of this, right? Like, it's not like we can suddenly just say, I'm going to burn my passport and I'm not going to recognize, you know, I'm just not going to be a citizen anymore or something, right? Like, there, there are certain structures that we're also embedded in. 
And then it's about finding, yeah, the terrain, the territory within which you're working. Like for me, there's something about poetry specifically and poetics and the aesthetics that allows me, um, you know, for me, it's, a lot of it is a return to spirituality, really. Like, uh, And I don't think, I don't think we can ever fully access a pre-colonial past. I'm not one of those people who will tell you we need to go back to the past in that sense. Like, that's not what I'm saying. Because uh, I don't think we can access the past. I think the past has been fragmented, right? Like, I think that that was very much the, the impact of the colonial intervention. But what we can do is still inspire ourselves and draw from those traces to go back to this turn, right? Draw from those fragments, those traces that is still exist. And the ways in which I think about it uh, for me is that then those traces in the present moment allow us to create models for the future. That's really where I want to go with my work, you know, like that's where I'm talking about the past, the present, and the past and the future. Because for me, my work in that sense is about giving giving that model, giving that, you know, like giving a structure. And maybe it won't work, right? Like maybe it won't be, maybe the next generation will be like, ah, you tried, but, you know, but hopefully that's a trace that I'm leaving for the next generation, right? Like, I don't think we can, I think we can have that nostalgia, but I don't think we can fully access like a pre-colonial past. Like, and I think we, we tend to idealize this. So I think for me, it's a, it's, a question of inspiring ourselves and working with, you know, working with what is it that we can access? And then from there, how do we reimagine, reimagine the space that we want to create? Side note, the title of my thesis was Reimagining the Past. Oh my God, full circle moment. I just realized this. The title of my thesis was Reimagining the Past, Remapping the Nation. That was the title of my MA thesis. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> full circle moment but yeah it, it's about reimagining the past and then you remap the future right like you you remap the future and you create a counter archive with this and hopefully that gives something for us to move forward which is different from the context within which you know like we're living and it also gives the future generations some a to tools with which they can also move forward thank you thanks thank you Wonderful, thank you. That that seems like such a great uh, conclusion to the talk. Although there is a question from Lee, but uh, I, he he seems to be okay with maybe just moving on. Um, Kama, thank you so much. This has been really wonderful. I've really thank enjoyed you. It. And um, Zomfam is available. You can order it from your bookstore. Just don't order it on Amazon. <laughs> order it from your local bookstore and also tell your library to order it. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Kama. Okay. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>